So uh, Dr. Jay Gambetta is the Vice President of IBM Quantum, in charge of the IBM's overall quantum initiative, which includes both quantum computing and quantum safe cryptography. He was named as an IBM Fellow in 2018 for his leadership in advancing superconducting quantum computing and establishing IBM's quantum strategy. He is a, a Fellow of the American Physical Society and has over 130 publications in the field of quantum information science with over 30,000 citations. So please join me in welcoming Jay Gambetta to the States. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. It's my pleasure to give the opening talk. I'll just give a high overview because uh, there's many talks that are going to follow. So why are we all interested in quantum computing? I think of it as um, it promises us to do a lot of hard problems. And some of these problems may even be intractable uh, classically. So we, we want to bring this new tool to be able to look at something that we couldn't do uh, further. I think rather than thinking of it as uh, computing, I like to think of it as an accelerator. And so what's interesting to me is how can we actually combine this quantum computer with the rest of classical computing to define the future of computing? So can, how can we actually advance fundamentals of computation? And so these are the two motivations. I look at it as we want to advance what it means to can be compute, and we want to bring in an accelerator that allows us to look at mathematical functions that are really hard to do classically. Um, IBM Quantum, we're very proud of the fact that in 2016, we put a system on the cloud. Up in the top, uh, um, top right is a picture of the IBM Quantum System 1. And then there's a, up in the top left is a picture of the last four processors. Each one of these processors uh, broke a new technology. The first, the Falcon, which was 27 qubits, allowed us to break the plane so to go to a two-dimensional grid. A hummingbird brought in multiplexing and allowed us to read out a lot more qubits with less lines. And then the Eagle and the recently released uh, Osprey really pushed what it was to build multiple uh, larger devices by integrating multiple level wiring and things like this that allow to get more I.O. into the chip. And so we're very proud of the fact that we've uh, hit up to 433 qubits. Uh, more importantly, it's cut off at the bottom, but uh, this plot shows how much adoption. And what is shown in the, in the um, blue is the number of packets, quantum circuits, that are run on our machines. And it's truly exponential. So we see more and more people using it. And recently, I think we just crossed 2 trillion executions on our machines. And the next step is we're, we're graduating. People are actually becoming developers. Kiskit was an open source project that we started. People are taking exams, becoming trained, being certified, and being able to get that acceleration going. So to me, I, th I see this as are really creating a community of using this technology. But beyond that, and I'm sure I missed uh, many papers, um, we also see exponential um, papers published using these machines. So more and more um, papers are getting published, scientific papers, treating this as a tool to push our science. Here's just a snapshot um, of collected of papers from uh, 2022 by the, um, the QIIC uh, and their researchers that are published using the machines. And you see everything from debugging circuits to understanding applications, and we'll hear a lot more about that. So I think, I hope I've established that I, I see this as a tool. And so how do we envision uh, using this tool? I've always looked at it as um, there's three fundamental uh, different types of algorithms, areas that uh, quantum computing may have value in. One is, as Feynman said originally, simulating quantum mechanics itself. Another is, like best shown by Shaw's most famous algorithm, how to find some structure, how to break some encryption, how to do something, something with data and structure. And the third is uh, non-exponentials, best used by example uh, exemplar of Grover's algorithm uh, for searching. But all of these essentially write some type of quantum circuit 
And to me, what quantum advantage is, is when we can run this uh, quantum circuit on a hardware that can solve some problem, either cheaper, faster, um, or more accurately than just using classical computing alone. As we've gone forward and worked with uh, many different industries, it's like these different sort of fundamentals, I call them algorithms, are now, now starting to get to connected to various industry domains. Uh, like as an example, you could take um, uh, something in uh, financial services and you can see that there are, it could use either these optimization uh, or these sort of search-based algorithms or um, it could use uh, some of these ideas in quantum machine learning to look at things like uh, fraud detection and things like this. And so we see that there's this emerging of different algorithms getting transferred uh, to industry verticals. So I put this up because I think we confused ourselves a bit in the community. A lot of people say, well, I'm doing NISC, fault tolerant quantum computing, or quantum inspired. I want to walk you through what I believe is a way where we can go continuously from the machines we have today to larger machines, and then how we'll integrate them with classical computing will allow us to do more and more. So to me, what we want to do is we want to be able to run, uh, achieve this thing of quantum advantage. And this requires two things. One of them is to be able to run quantum circuits faster on hardware. And the second is how do we map these quantum circuits to interesting problems. And if we start to think of quantum advantage by breaking it down into these two lenses, we can start to ask an engineering question on the first one, and then we can start to focus on the second one of how we actually apply it to different application areas. So the standard view, and best of what I've tried to summarize in this graph, is that you might have some complexity variable for quantum circuits, and the classical algorithm goes exponential. So as you increase the complexity of that circuit to simulate it classically, it would require exponential resources. And the standard idea is that, as, as shown with quantum algorithms, you could have an efficient runtime to do it, but to implement those quantum algorithms and get rid of noise generally requires an overhead uh, to implement error correction. So the standard goal is when we can get up here and cross this point, we can achieve something that we couldn't do classically. What error mitigation is, is, an, is a different way. It doesn't say I want to ignore the noise, but I want to process the noise in some way to get a result out that I know that I can put error bars on my system or error bars on my measurement to know that I've got some accuracy. And what you find is that you get a different exponential, but now the base of this exponential can be potentially different to classical. So there can be a crossing point that is much earlier. And so I view we're basically here today, and as I hope to convince you, that we'll be crossing this point in the next couple of years. And so essentially what you can do in this uh, theory paper we put out is you can show that the runtime is essentially a combination of how fast you can run those circuits, uh, a parameter, gamma, that represents the sampling overhead. If that was one, it would be the same as having um, error correction, essentially. But it, in general, it can be much more than uh, one. The D is the dis uh, depth of the circuit, and N is the size of the uh, quantum circuit to run. And so if we can lower this gamma small enough, much smaller than the exponential overhead of doing classical computing, then this runtime is the plot I showed before, can potentially be smaller. So to show that it works, this is a, um, a, a recent experiment that our team did. The top is a depth to 50 qubit circuit, and each one of these um, uh, bars are correlations to what we call a poly weight. So some correlation, be it a, here would be a one qubit correlator, and here would be a 49 qubit correlator. Because uh, the noise is generally local in some way, you see that the higher weights are exponentially damped without error mitigation. So you can't actually measure this higher weight correlation. What the team did is applied this error mitigation 
and you see that all the weights actually have a value all the way up to 9 qubits. And so this shows that the method is working. For this experiment, it was too hard to go beyond depth 2 because the gamma was too large, so we need to make the gamma smaller to do it, but it shows that all the way up to 50 qubits, this method is still working. Recently, the team took this to 127 qubits. This is not published uh, uh, yet. This is uh, done on one of our 127 qubit machines. And here we're only looking at um, low weight observables so that I don't have to measure too many correlators. But here you can see essentially that we could run a 100 qubit, 127 qubit by depth 36 experiment. I would argue this is the largest experiment, uh, largest quantum circuit ever run. And, and you can see that without applying the error mitigation, you get the exponential suppression of the, the noise. With applying it, we find that it actually reproduces what we expect, suggesting that this method can, keeps going up to these larger systems. So this is 127 by 36. <coughs> the team even uh, looked a bit further into more generalized um, ex expectation values. Here is a 65 qubit up to, um, um, I forget what depth, I think it was depth 15. And in this plot shows uh, two different uh, regimes. Where in the white is where the circuit has an efficient classical method to simulate it. In the blue is where an efficient classical method doesn't, doesn't necessarily exist. I personally think tensor methods would be able to simulate this, but for the argument here, um, exact diagonalization would not be able to do it. And so you see we're getting to this point where we can apply error mitigation in an area where we're starting to get to the point that it's beyond what we can simulate. So our goal is to create this tool that can run depth 100 circuits uh, with, on 100 qubits and be able to give an error mitigated result um, uh, in less than a day by, uh, to, by the end of 2024. So there's lots of theory that's been established to put all this going. I'm not going to go through the details. This is obviously just a subset of papers uh, by IBM uh, looking at measurement uh, mitigation, error mitigation. But you can go even further and you can ask, can I combine error mitigation and error correction? And it turns out the answer is yes. So this gives uh, a little bit more effort, uh, evidence to the thesis that we may be able to have a continuous path from error mitigated to error corrected. And so I don't think of today's machines, fault tolerant machines. I think of how can we actually make bigger, uh, more qubits, longer depth quantum circuits, and keep coming up with more and more novel ideas to allow us to run bigger and bigger quantum circuits. This paper is another example. One of the criticisms of um, error mitigation is it only applied to measuring observables. In this recent paper, there's still some issues with this paper, but what we looked at was, can you actually apply error mitigation to a sampling problem? And the answer turned out yes. So there's more and more F, uh, ideas that are emerging saying that error mitigation will be even more practical and potentially more powerful as we go forward. So I hope that we can make this path continuous and that error mitigation will be the tool that allows it to be the uh, be so. So to change um, a little bit different gear. So now I hope I've convinced you that in the near future we will be able to run some quantum circuits and get rid of those errors. In the software we release this resilience level where you could just basically turn on different methods. And so this is saying that the software will be easier and easier to use. I'm not going to go into too much details, but to say the same sort of math that applies to error mitigation also applies to breaking up larger problems. We call it circuit knitting. You can refer to it as circuit cutting, embedding methods, entanglement forging. The essential idea is, can I take a large problem, break it up into smaller problems, and if I can, then I can run those smaller problems, and then I can stitch them back together to get the answer of a larger problem. If I jump a bit into it, essentially imagine I have some type of user that wants to write some high-level problem. I have some type of classical computing 
that wants to do some type of processing of that problem. And then I have some type of quantum computer where the error mitigation or what we call these primitive functions that I just re uh, showed briefly is run. And so now you can think of it as you might have some type of problem that's written as a, some abstraction of a quantum circuit, very generic, plus some classical libraries, be it LAPAC, GNU Scientific, or um, the third example is SKKit. You'll want to compile that down into some, I, I call it a scheduled circuit that is parameterized that can run on some backend, maybe multiple of them, and some optimized, I don't know, um, more classical. And then you imagine that you want to be able to run multiple of these. And so you see that the future of this architecture is going to be classical and quantum. And even if we can provide error mitigated results that do this, there is so much to be done on the side of how we combine them all together. So in this video is sort of showing this idea. Here we imagine there's a user. This user is uh, doing a machine learning algorithm. And we imagine that we've got a cloud with multiple different um, 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 resources. And then in this video, the user starts. And first of all, the user just writes this high level of program, like generate some quantum circuit that's a, a, a function of some parameters and pairs, set it up to run and evaluate on uh, some cloud-based resources, and then, uh, and then executes it. So the first step would be something like orchestration, getting all these resources ready to be able to run this problem. And in this case, the resources are going to be three different one parts, one part for compiling. And here we see that you can imagine I've got this very generic high-level circuit of UX by uh, yeah, U dagger Y, and I compile it down into this uh, physical cube uh, circuit that can be run. And so now I've got this physical circuit, and I say, well, I want to be able to split this up as small as I can, so even more compiling to compile it down. And here I've split it, uh, cut it 18 times that allows me to split in this example into four circuits. And so now you want to be able to run these four circuits, and you want to be able to run them in parallel, get some result back. And so in this video is showing that if you've got multiple quantum processes, you can imagine them all running in parallel, running the result, returning the result to the user, and then sending that result all the way back uh, through the service for it to be basically turned into a larger number, uh, turned into some double, uh, some processing of the information and reconstructing the result. And so this sort of shows this architecture. And so for me, um, here's just an example, just showing simple code of how, how it can run. This is a 20 qubit experiment that is broken down into multiple uh, 10 qubit experiments. Uh, sorry, broken down into 10 qubit experiments and then reconstructed using different results. So in the, since I don't have much time, beyond this, we need to bring communication. And so this brings another aspect to how we're going to build larger systems. How are we going to be able to run multiple of these processes in parallel, do a classical communication between them, quantum communication, and eventually combine them to get larger and larger systems. So I just want to conclude, um, I'll skip this, by saying putting all these uh, together, defining modularity for uh, quantum, which I skipped, uh, coming up with how we do communication and, and basically come up with communication protocols that work on these machines, and the middleware for quantum defines what we call quantum-centric supercomputing. And so our goal is to, over the next few years, keep developing these parts. And just to end, I like to, this was a, a device that actually was built at IBM the year before I arrived. I think it was Tony, who's in the audience, was one of the people uh, that made it. It was a single qubit uh, device. And so you can see in just over 20 years, so here's a coin used for comparison of this device compared to my hands for this one, you can see how much how much has changed. And so I think in the next few years that this progress will continue. And so the next question is, how do we actually take these quantum processes, which we think in the near future will be able to run something we can't evaluate classically, combine it with classical computing to advance quantum? And I'm sure you're going to hear much more about this in this workshop. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Jay, for the great talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Maybe we can take one or two questions from the audience. I do have one question, Jay. Sure. Uh, so you've been talking about error mitigation as a way of uh, bridging the gap between near-term quantum computing and fault tolerance. Uh, what are your thoughts of using error mitigation for, um, for instance, lowering the threshold of uh, quantum error correcting codes? Do you see a pathway for that? So most of the techniques in error mitigation use ideas from error correction to come up with them. Either the, um, the PEC is like a driven by error correction ideas. The single shot is also driven by error correction. I do not expect um, error mitigation to lower the uh, effective threshold, but I do expect we will be able to apply error mitigation on top of logical error rates as we go forward. So I think there's two ways to make it continuous. One way is people often think of logical qubits and define them as fault tolerance. I don't really actually know that what that means, but I know what they mean by it. More importantly is running the quantum circuits and making your circuit fault tolerant. In doing that, there are various different overheads for different types of gates. So I'm more optimistic that error mitigation will allow us to tackle some of the overheads when we run the different types of gates rather than uh, dealing with a single encoding of, say, a logical qubit. So as we go forward and make this, try and make this path continuous, I think thinking of the circuit and how I protect the circuit and combine ideas from error mitigation is much more practical than seeing if I can do error mitigation and then encoding on top. That was a long answer to your question. Thank you. Any, any other question? Yes. Peripheral circuit in classical, classical circuit is also challenging, especially for the increased number of qubits on the device. So what's the most difficult part and what are your solutions or problems? So, so I didn't get time to go through this part, but how we go from a unitary circuit to one of these circuits that, let's call them physical circuits that can run, we need a lot of work on compiling. So whether it's compiling through circuit knitting or compiling through some optimization methods, I'm excited by a lot of the work I see a lot of students doing in thinking about approximate compiling. And if I know I'm going to have some type of errors or I'm going to have something present, how do I approximately get the right idea? And so I think there's got to be many, many different compiler paths that are developed. And I think as we go forward, there will be compiling that we need to run in um, real time inside these estimators. That probably is not going to be that difficult of compiling. That's going to be like getting all the equipment working, filling in parameters. And then there'll be offline compiling and things like this. And I think compiling for quantum circuits uh, is a great use case for HPC. And if we can spend as much time as we can preparing those uh, circuits uh, so they'll run as, as best as possible, I think that that is, is, is a great. But to answer your question, I think there's a lot of work uh, happening. I think uh, a lot of the traditional theoretical work is well established. But what people are doing in this sort of more numerical space where you've got to use a bit of empirical evidence or heuristic or some approximate compiling or finding or trying to reduce the depth, I think there's an open question, what are the best methods? Um, I think a few of those papers I flashed, flashed up showed this, but in general, I think that lots more research needs to be done in this space. All right. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Jay again for the great talk. Thank you.